thank you so much for joining us today, exploring the legacy of Charlie Munger, a conversation with Monish Pabrai. Hello, and uh, my name is Robert Pittenger with the YPO Mosaic Chapter. Monish Pabrai has been in, in a YPO member since 1997, lives in Austin, Texas, and graduated from Clemson University. He is CEO of Dondo Funds, which he grew from a million dollars with eight investors to $840 million as of December 31st. Massive, massive growth in that time. Uh, Monish authored two books on value investing, The Dondo Investor and Mosaic, Perspectives on Investing. So it is only fitting that he is speaking to the YPO Mosaic chapter today. Monish is a highly successful value investor who did it by his term, shamelessly cloning, as he explains, the management decisions of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. As a way to say thank you to them for his success, Monish Prabhupada, along with fellow YPOer Guy Spear, teamed up to purchase the 2007 charity lunch with Warren and Charlie for $650,000. The lunch was life-changing for both gentlemen, and Monish is here to tell us more about his close friend, Charlie Munger, which he uh, w- which developed out of that lunch. Besides his friendship, friendship with Charlie, one of the things Monish is most proud of is his lifetime ban from a casino in Las Vegas for his blackjack prowess. So, Modis, thank you for being with us today. We're so grateful, and uh, we look forward to, to hearing some of your wisdom about Charlie and about playing blackjack. So, th- the first thing that we'd like to start with is there's a quote that uh, you've talked about that Charlie Munger has said, which is, take a simple idea and take it seriously. Can you talk to us about uh, what that means and what Charlie meant by that line and how you've applied it in your life and, and in your and in your investing? Yeah, well, uh, Robert, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you. Always a pleasure to talk to YPOers. Like many of you, YPO has completely changed my life for the better. I can't even imagine what my life would have been if there was no YPO. There was uh, so many changes and improvements uh, YPO brought along. And also, I also wanted to share my grief and condolences with all of you on October 7th. You know, I think many of you maybe directly or indirectly maybe knew some of the victims or the folks who got injured or maybe the folks who got taken hostage and so on. So my thoughts and prayers are with you on that. And hopefully we'll get to a finish line on that at some reasonable point, hopefully. Yeah, so my friendship with Charlie was quite unexpected and accidental. Never expected to even meet him. And that was a great bonus of my life. First time I met Charlie was even before the Buffett lunch was at a YPO event. So actually one of the YPOers who wrote Poor Charlie's Almanac, Peter Kaufman, arranged for him to speak to YPO. And I just moved to California then. I think it must have been 2004 or something. And so that was the first time I met Charlie and actually hung out with him a bit. The quote you brought up, take a simple idea and take it seriously. It's a famous Munger quote. And it's something that I've always tried to practice in my life, even before I heard of Charlie or even before I heard about that quote, because I think it's so powerful. So I think that as we go through life, we get some aha moments, you know, where we uncover some nugget of wisdom or knowledge, maybe many other humans have either not figured out or not given the amount of weight they should to that particular piece of wisdom and knowledge. And it can become a source of a tremendous competitive advantage. And so one of the things I learned about very early was the power of cloning and the power of copying. And I remember when I was in my early 20s, I read this book by Tom Peters. You know, he was a big management guru in the 80s, where he was giving the example of these two gas stations in California that were diagonal on a busy intersection from each other. And both the gas stations were self-serve. And so you come in, you pump your gas and you leave. In one case, the owner would come out maybe once an hour or something, pick a random car, and wash the windshield or check the oil, just some extra service at no charge. And the guy who was diagonal across the street was seeing this take place. And he said to himself, well, that's kind of stupid. You can't do it for everyone. If you did it for everyone, you'd lose your shirt because you're not charging for it. And he never copied or cloned that. And over time, what happened is that the gas station that was providing this random extra service 
saw an increase in business and the one diagonal from him saw a decrease. Even after seeing the decrease, the guy across the street did not change behavior. So Tom Peter said, and this is what I found very unbelievable. He said that you can go to your most direct competitors and you can sit down with them and you can give them all your trade secrets everything you've learned that has given you an advantage. And they will listen to you, but there will be no behavior change. Okay? So I read that. I said, this is ridiculous. This cannot be the way the world works. You know, and I'm in my early 20s. I haven't really kind of experienced life, and I don't know kind of how things work. But I made a promise to myself that I'm going to prove Tom Peters wrong. Okay? And I was going to prove him wrong two ways. One, I was going to look or instances where humans see something smart happening and copy or clone it, because that would prove him wrong. And the second is, whenever I personally see someone doing something smart, I'm going to copy it, because that also proves him wrong. And from my early 20s till now, this year I'm going to be 60, what I found, because I became a student of this, is that Tom Peters was mostly right. Humans are really, they, I still don't know why it is the case, but humans have an aversion to cloning. They somehow consider it beneath themselves that, you know, I didn't come up with this or this is not my idea and that sort of thing. Something, some weird thinking like that. And what I also found is that when I forced myself to copy things that I found to be smart, it gave me a big edge. And so this was an example of a simple idea. And what I found is that there were a very small sliver of humans who were master cloners. And these small sliver of humans owned the world. They really, really did very well. So for example, almost everything at Microsoft is cloned. Microsoft spends so many billions of dollars on Microsoft research and their research labs and so on, nothing has ever come out from that. What has worked for them is looking at Lotus and creating Excel, looking at WordPerfect and creating Word, looking at the Mac and creating Windows, and on and on and on. And even now, OpenAI is a partnership with AI. You know, Google actually did the work, Microsoft did none of the work, and they're ahead. You know, and so Sam Walton was another great cloner, you know, and in fact, uh, Costco, you know, Jim Senegal, who was the longtime founder CEO of Costco, he had cloned the entire model from Sol Price, who he used to work for. And someone asked him, what did you learn from Sol Price? And his response was, it's the wrong question. Everything I know is from Sol Price. You know, so he says, there's nothing I know that did not come from Sol Price. So these were people who took a simple idea very, very seriously. And so it's not just enough to read about some idea, be impressed with it, whatever. But when you see that something really grabs you, you have to go all in and you have to fight the normal tendency of the status quo. And I think Charlie, I mean, both Charlie and Warren, I think their success has come from the dogged pursuit of a few very simple ideas. And once they figured, so for example, when they bought a C's candy in the 70s in California, it was a huge jump for them. They paid three times book value for the company. They thought they were paying too much. And they didn't understand how good a business it was. And the only thing Warren did every year is he left the management alone to run the business. But on January 1st of each year, he personally changed all the prices. And he changed all the prices significantly above the rate of inflation. So inflation was 3%, he would raise the price 10%. And the next year it was 3 or 4%, he'd raise another 10%. And what surprised him was he kept pounding in these very heavy price increases and unit volumes kept going up. And it stunned him. It stunned him that you could have a business with this much pricing power. And both Warren and Charlie did not understand brands 
and did not understand the power of brands. But they became very ardent students of what was this phenomena? What did this mean? How can we apply this in other businesses? And it was fundamental to the Berkshire that we see today, right? Because it was, again, looking at a relatively simple idea, but really trying to get your arms around it. So I think that uh, all of us, you know, many of us who start businesses, we start businesses because we see an offering gap. You know, we see something, some product or service that should exist in the world, but maybe doesn't or not enough of it and so on. And we go into it. I think, I think once we take that plunge, having this notion of the dogged pursuit of simple ideas will lead to a lot of good things. So Charlie kept the bust of Ben uh, Franklin, didn't he? Yeah. Can you talk about his connection? What did he? What? How did he feel connected to Ben Franklin? Can you talk about? Uh, he looked up to Ben Franklin. Would love to hear your thoughts on that and and what Ben Franklin meant to to Charlie. Yeah. So I think Ben Franklin is a person very much worth studying. Many of us know, you know, different Franklin courts, and we've kind of. Looked, we, we are familiar with Ben Franklin, the founder of the United States and so on. But uh, Walter Isaacson wrote a very good biography on ben, ben Franklin. He's the same guy who wrote the biographies on Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. And so I think the overdosing on Franklin, which is a very good idea, simple idea, taken seriously, is, is a really good thing. Franklin, actually, uh, there are many aspects of Franklin, of Franklin that would resonate with YPOs, because Franklin basically started out as an entrepreneur, right? And so he had a printing business and a publishing business, and he yearned for independence, financial independence, independence of thought, all kinds of independence. And in his early 40s, he basically sold his business to his apprentice with no money, basically changing hands at the time. And he just told his apprentice, you just pay me a percentage of the profits over the next few decades, whatever, right? And sort of the win-win for both sides. And once he freed himself from the, you know, the daily vicissitudes of running a business, he could focus on bigger things and more interests. And so Franklin was, you know, he was a really polymath, you know, he did, he invented so many things, you know, bifocals, the lightning rod and uh, figuring out electricity and so many other things. He was a philosopher. Without him, there's no United States. So he was very central to getting France to support the United States against England by sending troops. So if you think about it, one monarch monarchy was going to fight another monarchy to help the foundation of a democracy. Okay. It just doesn't make any sense on the surface. But the French came through and sided with the Americans and fought the British and led to the independence of the colonials and basically the foundation and formation of America. So he was also very pragmatic. You know, the, the founding fathers are an interesting group. It's actually worth studying all of them. But they were very different from each other. And Franklin had many ideas about what the United States should be. Many of those went by the wayside. But he was practical in uh, the formation of basically coalitions and compromises to get to the end point. So I think Charlie very much appreciated Franklin from the point of view of this creation of independence. And Charlie himself really yearned to be financially independent. He didn't want to be financially independent to buy Ferraris. He wanted financial independence so he could do and say whatever he thought he wasn't kind of a servant to anyone, if you will. And he could pursue his, whatever his passions were in life. In fact, he used to joke, he said that, you know, I was always pursuing financial independence. And I think I overshot a bit, you know, where <laughs> he ended up with you know, a few billion dollars that he really didn't need, you know, but uh, but it it is what it is. I I think, you know, many of us joke that Charlie is Ben Franklin reincarnated. They were, if there ever is a reincarnation of Ben Franklin, it would have been Charlie Munger. They're very similar in a lot of their attributes. You know, 
When I met Buffett for lunch, I'd asked him, uh, Mr. Buffett, if you could meet anyone living or dead for, for lunch, who would you like to meet? And uh, he says, first, I'd like to meet Sophia Loren. Okay. He was always a big fan of Sophia Loren. And then he says, no, 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 scratch that answer. I, I really want to meet Isaac Newton. I, if I really could, I would like love to have had lunch with Isaac Newton. So I said, why, why would you want to, why do you pick Newton? All the people you could have picked to have lunch with, why do you pick Newton? He said, well, you know, Newton invented calculus. He said, Newton probably was the smartest human who ever lived. And he said then that he said, Newton was the smartest, but Franklin was the wisest. And so he said, my meeting with Newton would really be along the lines of, you know, he got swept up into the euphoria of the South Sea bubble. He lost his fortune uh, where he first saw the bubble, saw the foolishness of the bubble, then participated in the bubble himself, you know, and, and then he lost his fortune. And so he said, I, that that would be my line of inquiry is how does the mind, that wonderful a mind, go so adrift. But Franklin, you know, Franklin was clearly the wisest and Charlie was up there, you know. I don't think I in my lifetime, ever met a man who was wiser or smarter than Charlie. There's a big difference in the IQ level and the wisdom, even between Warren and Charlie. No comparison, actually. Can you talk about more of that and how Charlie changed uh, Warren's thought processes on, in, on investing over the years? Yeah, I think Warren, uh, this year at the Berkshire, in the Berkshire annual letter, uh, if you guys, you know, go to the BerkshireHathway.com and pull up the letter, he has a one page and a tribute to Charlie. And he talks about how Charlie is the architect of Berkshire and Warren is the general contractor. And he said, basically, Charlie, you know, Berkshire was built to the blueprint of Charlie. And basically, Warren was trained and studied under Ben Graham, and he was very heavily influenced by Ben Graham. Ben Graham's entire investing framework came out of the depression and came out of the market crash. So he went looking for the stocks that were most widely mispriced, the cheapest stocks, because he was always concerned about you know not losing principal and reducing risk. And Charlie, in some of his early adventures in business, realized that there were some businesses that just gave you one difficult decision after another. And there were other businesses that were so easy to run and they made a lot of money. And so there was no real correlation between how difficult a business was and how, how much money you made. In fact, there was an in inverse correlation. And so he told Warren that you made a big mistake buying Berkshire Hathaway, but I'm gonna to try to help you fix it. And he said, rather than buying a fair business at a good price, you need to buy good businesses at a fair price. And that is a huge transition for someone like Buffett, who has so much respect for Ben Graham. And he also used an approach created by Ben Graham to compound money at very high rates, you know, into the 30s per year. And so for someone to give up something that worked so well for, for, for him, and move in the direction of Charlie Munger. A Warren said it was just only happened because of the power of Charlie's mind. And Charlie was really remarkable in the sense that he let Warren come to the other side at his own pace, never criticized him for any decisions he made. Warren till today has very deeply embedded in him the bargain hunter, which surfaces from time to time. And Charlie would see that but he wouldn't really rub it in his face. And kind of, he was, it was interesting because I think what I noticed with Charlie is Charlie was on the board of Costco for almost three decades. And I know that the institutions, all the institutions whose boards and uh, stuff he got involved with, like the Westlake, Harvard Westlake School in Los Angeles or the UCSB or Stanford or University of Michigan, I know that all these institutions got improved. But the interesting thing about his finesse was he was able to improve them without the institutions feeling that he was imposing their will on them. So he kind of cajoled them into a direction without them even realizing that 
they were being cajoled in a particular direction. I met Jim Sinegal, the founder of Costco, at the Charlie Memorial on March 10th. The family had a memorial for him in LA, a wonderful ceremony. And I asked Jim Sinegal, Jim Sinegal actually spoke at the memorial. I said, Jim, Charlie was on the board for three decades. What can you point to that is different at Costco than if Charlie was not there? And he couldn't think of anything. And the reason he couldn't think of anything is because Charlie pushed them into an area so in a, such a subtle manner that they think it's their ideas. You know, it's like their thinking and their ideas. Like he always pushed them to think long term. Costco is really not a retailer. It's a buying agent for the customer. It's a very different mindset. And he reinforced that. And the reinforcements took place in such a manner that they don't even realize that there was an influence, which is so beautiful. Speaking of mindset, Charlie had, uh, when he made decisions, he had uh, mental models that he would talk about. Can you talk about Charlie's mental models and how he made decisions? Yeah. So, you know, he was a very prolific reader. I would guess that Charlie was reading maybe 200 to 500 books a year on a wide variety of subjects. You know, sometimes I would go to see him and there'd be a book on, you know, global warming he was reading. Many times I'd see him reading a physics book and, you know, just different, just very wide range of interests. And uh, there were two things that were very amazing about Charlie's brain. One was that Charlie, from all that reading and all that experience, has had etched into his brain certain mental models about the way the world works, which would maybe sometimes not be the way we, we would think they work. So for example, the model I gave you about cloning, humans having an aversion to cloning, this would not be something that you would normally conclude. You know, it's unusual, weird. There's another mental model, for example, which is the human tendency for reciprocation. So when we, when we lived in hunter-gatherer societies and in small groups, and some guy had a very successful hunt and brought down a big beast, and he brought this beast to his fellow, fellow you know, community, he would store the beef or the meat in the bellies of his neighbors because there's no refrigeration. What are you going to do? You can't eat the meat yourself and you can't really store it, so it's going to spoil. So what he would do is he'd call all his neighbors and they would have a great feast. And everyone would remember was that Joe is a really good guy, okay? Because Joe shared his spoils with us. And so when Frank would have a big beast he would bring down, Joe would be invited for sure to the feast, right? So reciprocation in humans, Charlie believed, was etched into our brains from the times of hunter-gatherer. But there's a quirk. The thing is that what the mental model that got etched into our brains does not have a calibration engine. So what that means is that if I do you a favor, all you know is Monish is a good guy. Monish did me a favor. You're not able to calibrate how big a favor did he do. You just have good feelings about me. And so when you don't have a calibration engine, and you just feel good about somebody. And, you know, salesmen take advantage of this particular quirk in just human cognitive thinking. And I've taken advantage of it when I built my business. So, for example, if someone approaches Pabrai funds and they say, hey, I'm interested in your funds. Can you send me some information? What most of my competitors do is they send everything digital, you know, because it's efficient, right? We also send it digitally, but we also send a physical package. And in the physical package, there's some goodies in there. There's a very nice cross pen, okay? And there's a book and a few other things. Now, the recipient of this package, the minimum investment is a few million dollars, okay? When, when they get my pen, which is a very nice pen, they feel obligated in some way. The only way to 
kind of equalizer obligation is wire a few million dollars. And so, or if they don't wire a few million dollars, returning that pen is really complicated. You know what I'm saying? You're going to go to you know, package it and send it to the post office and whatever. So if I send out a hundred of these packages, maybe one or two out of a couple of hundred come back saying, thank you for your package. I don't have an interest in the services of the fund, warm regards, right? But 98, 99% don't come back. And those 98, 99% feel good about Monish. And they, a, a decent percentage of them wire the money. So it's $50 one way and a few million the other way because there's no calibration engine. Okay, so as you, so Charlie had probably 50 to 100 of these models, maybe more. And what was so fantastic about Charlie's brain is he had these models in his brain and I've never seen any other human who's able to do this, which is I think why I think there's no humans with Charlie's kind of brain power. I would bring up something to him. He's never thought about this, some new stock or some problem I'm having with Dakshin or the foundation or something. And he's instantly correlated three models working together and giving the answer. And so, so his ability to have these models in his brain and to know which three applied and how they interact with each other when they apply together, that's, you know, I'm a very juvenile kind of practitioner of that. Charlie was the, you know, the, the Kung Fu master. You know, he was a Yoda on that front. And it gave him a big advantage. So usually, and then Warren said that Charlie had the best 60 second mind to analyze any business, especially in businesses. Anytime I brought up any business to him, he was so fast. And mainly he was really fast at getting to a no and getting to a no for at least one good reason very quickly. So it took away a lot of noise from his life. Speaking of bringing uh, businesses to him for his feedback, you, you made some investments in some companies in Turkey some number of years back when it was not on anyone's radar. I'm curious, did you run those by Charlie? If not, it'd be great to hear some of the things that you did run by Charlie and his thoughts. Every time I brought up Turkey to him, Charlie was very negative. Okay. He would instantly say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to hear about it, whatever. Right. And, but I persisted. Okay. <laughs> so I persisted with Charlie. We own a Coke bottler in Turkey. Right. And of course, I know Charlie knows the Coke business really well. Obviously, they, they, they're a huge shareholder in Coke. So I said, Charlie, tell me how I'm going to lose money on this. One. Okay. So he said, it's going to work. Okay. <laughs> so, so I said, but you were so negative. He said, no, that's going to work. That's fine. That's going to work. You know? So, so I, I, got, I saw him kind of shift as I talked to him. So more. I think his frame on something like Turkey was that it would be such so much work for him to take that leap or to do the work, et cetera, or make the trips, whatever, that he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to focus. Because, you know, this is, we are in a business with no call strikes. You know, you're, you're at the plate. It's not like baseball, three strikes and you're out. You can let a thousand pitches go by, right? Thousand good pitches. So if Charlie says no to Turkey and Turkey does really well, doesn't matter. What actually matters is that he shouldn't be saying yes to something that doesn't do well. You know, and so that's kind of how we thought about it. Yeah. So I think uh, on Turkey, I finally got him to uh, move a little bit. That was okay. Can you talk about his sense of humor? I, I heard something that uh, even uh, when he got to the hospital in his uh, last time, he, he still had a sense of humor. Oh, yeah. I think, I think he joked with the nurse. I think the nurse asked him, you know, how are you? He said, oh, I'm dying. How about you? You know, <laughs> you know? so the thing about Charlie is so one month before exactly one month before Charlie passed away, I had my last dinner with him. And I didn't know it was going to be my last time seeing him. And it was one-on-one, -on -one, just, just him and me on a Saturday at his home. And of course, his mind was very sharp, but he was telling me there's a lot of things wrong with his body and, uh, and different things. And the day or the day before he passed away, when he was in the hospital, 
he was trying to close one last grant to a nonprofit. So Charlie, I don't think Charlie had a, a belief in God. I think he was agnostic. And I know that he basically didn't believe there was nothing after. You know, his belief was, it's this is it. And, you know, he had one of his big uh, mental models. And, you know, when I think in an interview he gave just about, I think, a month or three weeks before he passed away, they asked him, you know, what would you like on your gravestone if someone were to put something in your gravestone? And he said, I tried to be useful. And the I tried to be useful is actually exactly a simple idea that he took very seriously. So he extracted everything he could from his mind and his body till the last day, right? I mean, basically till the last day, I mean, his family is with him and all that, but he's still trying to help some nonprofit do better, right? There's no upside to him doing that. He's not trying to publicize that. There's no legacy or anything. It's just a selfless act. And even with Warren, I think the the relationship got built because of so many selfless acts. So there's a book. I don't think Charlie ever read this book. It's a book by Adam Grant called Give and Take. And it's a great book to read. And Adam Grant basically said that there are three kinds of people in this world. The givers, the takers, and the matchers. Okay. The givers are the people who are always trying to do things for others without any scorecard and without anything in return. They just want to help you, okay? The takers, I don't need to explain what a taker is. You just want to have nothing to ever do with a taker. They just want to extract from you with never giving anything back, selfish people. And then the matchers who think they're really smart, oh, Robert did X for me. I'm going to do exactly X for him, okay? What Adam pointed out in his book is that the givers end up owning the world. And they end up owning the world because there's so much goodwill they generate with all the people around them. And Charlie never read that book, but Charlie was a giver. He never really tried to think about what is it in it, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? So I'll give you a story, which is a funny story, but it also has a couple of very beautiful lessons. So one time I used to play bridge with Charlie at the LA Country Club. Uh, he would play on Fridays and probably like maybe one or two times a month, I would meet him and his friends for bridge. So usually we would have lunch starting at about 1230 at the LA Country Club in the dining room, very nice food and ambiance. And then we'd go off to play bridge, right? For like three, four hours. So I was sitting on this, you know, table for four and sitting across from me were Charlie Munger and Rick Gurren. Uh, they were very close friends. They'd done, you know, Rick was the one who brought Seas Candy to their attention. And I told the two of them, I said, you know, you guys think this is just some bridge game and this is just some lunch. Okay. But I want to just tell you guys, this is a fucking iconic moment. Okay, that some yo-yo Indian guy from some suburb in Mumbai is sitting with two massive historic icons. And I know you, you guys don't think that's the case, but that's how I think about it. Okay, I told him that. So I said, when you guys were, you know, in the 60s shooting fish in a barrel after the water had been run out with all the deals you guys were doing, tell me about one of the more interesting deals. Okay. So the two of them look at each other and Rick Gorin tells him, why don't you tell him about that redhead nurse? And Charlie's language always with me was very colorful. You know, I don't think we went three sentences without the F word. And Charlie says, oh yeah, yeah. He says, Rick, yeah, that's a good story. So he tells me, he said there was this uh, maverick entrepreneur in California, Southern California, who had come up with this kind of uh, liquid adhesive you could pour into your radiator if there was a leak and it would automatically seal any leaks. And to build sales, what the guy did was he used to go to different auto body shops, auto repair shops, call the mechanics and then pull out his gun and shoot a hole in his car's radiator and then pour the liquid and show them that there was no leak, okay? And that's how he built sales, okay? Now, this guy, 
passes away, premature, you know, heart attack. The wife who is grieving finds out that the executor of his will is this redhead nurse who he was having an affair with that she didn't even know about, okay? So he left the business and all the assets to the wife, but he made the mistress the executor of the will, okay? And both the women were pissed off at each other, okay? Each was more pissed than the other. And the business itself actually was basically bankrupt. They had some debt and it really didn't have any value beyond the debt. And Charlie and Rick wanted to buy the business. There were two $80,000 notes that were owed to two aunts of the wife. And so they could have bought those notes at a discount from those two women. And the equity really didn't have any value. So they could have paid like, you know, maybe 100,000 for instead of 160,000. But Charlie told Rick, we don't want to take advantage of these women. We want to pay full price to them. So he talked to the wife and he talked to the two aunts and he said, look, we'd like to buy the business. It really doesn't have much value. We'll pay 80,000 to each of you and we need you to sign off on it. And we need that other nurse because she's the executor of the will to cooperate as well. And the nurse was not willing to sign off on anything. She wasn't going to get anything and she was pissed off. And so Charlie arranged to meet the nurse at the California club for lunch. He had never met her before. He, he wanted to basically smooth the feathers and you know explain to her that this was the right thing to do and so on and so forth. And the California club is a very kind of, you know, blue blood, old institution, big ceilings and Charlie always sat in the same dining table. I actually met him for the first time at the California Club. And she came directly from, from work in her nurse's uniform, which was one size too small for her. And everyone in the dining room thinks that Charlie's having lunch with a porn star, you know? And they're like aghast. You know, this is Mr. Munger. We all love Mr. Munger. Mr. Munger is a very honorable citizen of Los Angeles, et cetera. What's she doing with a porn star? And Charlie himself is really surprised at the way she appears. Anyway, he kind of says, I kind of controlled myself. I tried to control my eyes. I basically uh, pacified her and we got the deal done. Okay. And now, so they bought the business for 160000 uh, and they got it done. Two years after that, uh, Rick Gurren needed money and they owned the business 50-50. So he told Charlie, listen, I need a couple of hundred thousand and I'm tight and I want to sell you this business. You can take over hundred percent of it. And Charlie asked him, what do you think it's worth? What's your portion worth? He says, my portion's, I think, worth 200,000. So Charlie says, no, you're wrong. Your portion is worth 300,000. And here's the check for 300,000. So he didn't take advantage of those two women paid them a full price. He didn't know them. And he didn't take advantage of Rick Gorin. I mean, think about it. A seller is proposing a selling price and you're proposing to pay 50% above the selling price the seller is proposing. Okay. But that's what that's how Charlie was. He always wanted to make sure that if you did business with him, you felt like you got the better end of the deal. And, and so these win-win Things. Now, obviously, once you do something like that for Rick, you've cemented a friendship and trust and everything else for a lifetime and beyond. And, you know, Rick will do anything for you. So I think that I found the story funny, but I think that story also has some many, many good lessons. For us. So I think in business, when we think about it, things in that context of win-win as opposed to transactional, I think we get a lot of tailwind. What did Charlie say? Well, tell me about your conversation with Charlie when you got banned from the casino. Yeah, I mean, so basically both Warren and Charlie, you know, Warren has a saying. He says that I wanted to be a bookie, by, but my parents wouldn't approve of it, so I went into the insurance business, right? They basically are both betting personalities. 
you know, they are gamblers, but they're gamblers in the sense that they only want to bet when the odds are in their favor. So they're never going to go, you know, sit down at the table in, in Vegas or anything. So I knew that Charlie's got all this, you know, gambling mindset. And I explained to him, I went to him one time, I said, Charlie, by the way, I just got banned from this casino in Vegas. And I explained to him how I got banned. And I explained to him my system. He had so much fun with that. He loved that, you know, because basically for him, it was all about these bets where the odds were in your favor. And I, I found an anomaly where this particular casino had really thin odds because their location was off strip and they needed to bring people in to come and play there. And so they had improved the game versus what you would normally find. The game was still in their favor. Like the average guy playing there would lose money. But if you, you know, applied a couple of tweaks that I did. In fact, the funny thing is I had a good relationship with these guys, taken them for about 150,000 over a few months. And they came and told me, the guy, the general manager came and sat down with me and said, you know, stop dealing to him. And then the dealer was continuing to deal he got angry. He said, right now, stop dealing to him. Okay. And then she's like, you know, taken aback. And then he tells me, look, Monish, we love you. We enjoy having you. I watched your videos. I read your book. And we watched all the video of you playing. And we can't have you play blackjack here anymore. I said, you know, you guys have problems with card counters. I'm not counting cards. You know that. He said, that's what had us confused. Because we watched the tape for a while and it was very clear to us you weren't counting cards. But we figured out that your system, we can't beat your system. And so we're done. So that's the way. So they said you can come to the casino, you can use all the facilities, but you cannot sit down at the blackjack table. So to me, actually, I was actually very proud of that because basically the system worked. That's what I was really trying to do, you know, from a hourly pay point of view, I'm better off pursuing other pursuits, but it was just fun to do it. You know. Over the years, Monish, what surprised you the most about, about Charlie? We know that he was a good businessman and a good investor and a good partner. I saw him interact. He had eight kids. He had so many in-laws, grandkids, great grandkids with a wide range of personalities, right? And uh, Charlie loved a quote of Ben Franklin, you know, so there's a quote of Ben Franklin where Ben Franklin says, keep your eyes wide open before you get married and half shut afterwards. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and Charlie actually, I think that's really what I noticed with him is that he applied a very different kind of framework and mental models in how he dealt with different people. Like sometimes, you know, I would be interacting with, or I would watch him interact with someone. And then when the person left, I'd say, you know, Charlie, he says, yeah, I know. Like, you know, he'd understand that that person had, you know, different quirks or whatever. But the way he finessed all of that, I think there were a lot of lessons I learned that this wasn't just some polymath. I think this was a person who really was wise and, you know, understood the, spectrum of the way humans work and how to navigate around that spectrum. He really had seen and figured out a lot of things about different nuances, and it was very helpful to him. You know, Monish, you know YPOers very well. How can we as YPOers become better investors uh, modeling ourselves after Charlie? I would say that there's a book called Poor Charlie's Almanac, and uh, they've come out with a new edition. But if you go to the older editions, I think those are better. The new edition doesn't have that much illustrations and all of that. I think the old one is a little better. At the back of the book is 11 speeches he gave. And I think the, there's a lifetime of wisdom in those speeches. I feel if someone uh, went through those speeches and understood them, it's better than a four-year college degree anywhere. And just one of those speeches, which is the psychology of human misjudgment, uh, where he goes through different mental models of how the different quirks in our brains wiring, because of all our evolution, our brains are very far from just purely rational. And so uh, having a good understanding of exactly how the apparatus between our ears functions, uh, really functions, it gives us a huge leg up. And so I think that 
if we uh, and a lot of his wisdom was distilled was distilled into those 11 speeches so i think that if I try to read, reread them every year, and every year I can swear that I'm reading something I've never read before. Some some passage I think I've never read before, and so different things kind of dawn on me at different times. That's what I would say is a great way to improve, not just as a business leader, but improve as a spouse or as a father or grandfather or a son or daughter like that. You know. Very good. Yeah, I'd like to open up for questions if anyone has questions at this time. So Bruce Bendell says, you've been in YPO over 25 years. So what, if anything, did Charlie think about YPO? Yeah. So both Charlie and Warren, you know, they were not members of YPO. And Warren actually used to joke and say, I, I keep telling them make an age exception for me, you know, and <laughs> let me in, but they won't. And they both had a lot of respect for YPO. They both spoke to YPO at multiple occasions. And one time I discussed YPO directly with Charlie and he said, it's a wonderful organization, it has a great mission and it's really good. So Excellent. they understood it and I think uh, they were right on on that. Very good. I think, uh, Jose, can, we can't hear you. I think you're, uh, I think you're on mute. In the meantime, Boaz Gilad has a question. Uh, yeah. How did Charlie manage the amount of money that he left behind? Yeah, so Charlie's wife uh, had a accident. She basically fell backwards down the stairs at their home in Minnesota and then she suffered for about maybe a year or 18 months and then a lot of surgeries and then passed away. And she had always wanted half their assets to go to their eight children. And it just so happened, you know, uh, that the year she died was the only year in the U.S. tax code when there was no estate tax. There was a quirk in the way the taxes were done and that was one year. It's funny, people used to joke it was the year you throw grandma off the bus, you know, <laughs> basically you won't pay any taxes. And uh, it just happened that she died that year. And uh, I think uh, at that time, I think Charlie's net worth was about 2 billion or so. I think this was 2010, 2010 or so that this happened. So he passed on about 125 million to each of his kids at, at that time in Berkshire stock which would be probably worth like maybe four or 500 million each now, maybe 400 million or something. And uh, the kids have done amazing things in terms of from a philanthropic point of view. So they've been very impressive uh, things that they have done, very different from each other. And then Charlie basically said, okay, now the other half, he used to tell me I'm just focused on giving it away. And uh, he made quite a few uh, different grants and things that he was doing. But I still think that when he passed away, it may have been maybe a couple of billion. Uh, and I don't know what he kind of bequeathed or intended to do with that. I, I don't think he was planning for more to go to the kids. Uh, so he must have uh, planned something out, but I'm not sure about that. Very good. Very good. What other questions do we have? Any other questions before we we're getting close to the top of the hour here. Excellent. Anything else you want to share before we go, Monish? I always enjoy speaking to YPO. And of course, uh, being able to speak about Charlie was wonderful. I miss him terribly. I have been reflecting back. We had a very unlikely 15-year friendship. And I never expected that. I always remember I'd walk into Charlie's house. Uh, he'd be working on some architectural plans or something. He'd see me. And there'd be a twinkle in his eye. He would be very happy and excited to see me. And we'd always have a great time together. And one of the things I've always felt is that I always had a lot of faith in Charlie's judgment. And he had a very strong, positive opinion of me. And any time if I get into you know, self-doubt or anything, I always say, whatever I may think about myself, I have no doubt that Charlie nailed me perfectly. And he thought well of me. So life is okay. You know, everything's okay. I always you know, fall back to that, but I miss him a lot. And I'm very grateful that my life was able to cross with such a remarkable person. I'll never see someone like that again. They broke the mold after they made Charlie. So we're not going to see another Charlie Munger again, but he left us a great body of work 
And it's wonderful to be able to look at that. Well, Monish, thank you for taking the, taking the time. You're just an amazing disciple of both Charlie and Warren. I myself really enjoy following you uh, on your podcast and on uh, social media. So thank you for being so active. And uh, we hope to have a uh, future uh, connection and, and discussion with you in, uh, in, at other events. Absolutely. I, I very much enjoyed it, Robert. And thank you very much for all of you and uh, all the best. 